Well, it's a very warm welcome this evening, Tuesday evening, to Insight Live. We have a great program for you, a very a full hearted program, and it's great that you could join us. Remember, we are live and interactive, and uh, you can email us or SMS us, and the details are on your screen right now live at Revelation TV. So we encourage you to participate, uh, and uh, I will just see how it goes. Good. Well, tonight we have a very special program, and as you know, I, we always kind of interview or have an informal chat with guests before we go live. And so tonight we're speaking to um, author David Metter about his experience of 16 years in a children's care home. And just that story alone, I mean, you could listen to it for hours and not get bored. And then it just goes on. And then we're gonna also look at his life after the children's care home and uh, already he is writing on his second book melody yep, yep. <laughs> and it's gonna be a third and a fourth and a, and a fifth but an incredible life and I, I i remember when i was interviewing him you were kind of tired you were in bed and you were you kept shouting out me well ask him this and ask him that and ask him this mm -hmm. because it was just so so engrossing yeah i think when you uh get to know somebody or they've written a book about their life and and there are some things that are just so foreign to some of us and uh, david's life um, in care homes and uh, you know the things that he experienced it's going to be absolutely fascinating so stay with us i want to tell you a little bit about his book now it's called 16 years in care a journey to freedom from rejection pain and loneliness and uh, in his journey, he kind of weaves and finally uh, he, he gets faith. And you just see, uh, you know, I, I would call it heroism, you know, the way he is. He grew up in, uh, in care. You know, there were challenges, of, obviously, for him as a child and especially as a child, you know, um, you know, and kind of basically not being orphaned, I mean, being orphaned, but not being adopted. Uh, you know, he had many questions why he was in care, you know, and, and you know, just making his way, you know, successfully in the wider world. And we know that God is with him, uh, was with him and is with him. And he tells how he struggles to make sense of his experiences and the early childhood. And I'm sure, uh, you know, we are going to hear some very interesting things. And when he came to faith, found healing for himself. You can see David there on the, on the screen right now. And you know, just how he found redemption and the way that God led him you know, facing through all these adversities. So, um, shall we uh, interact uh, already? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I think they brought you on. I don't want to run, run out of time, so let's go right no, now. No, we may as well as well, may as well. But I mean, come, David, you are very, very welcome. Uh, a huge warm welcome from the Revelation TV family. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us this evening on Insight Live. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. It's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, a privilege. Well, I can't, we can't wait to get dug into this because I know a lot of our viewers are going to be going, well, how did he even survive that? You know, people are talking about, you know, uh, panic attacks and anxiety, depression, mental health issues and things like that. And here you are, you know, completely integrated into society, uh, writing books and, and looking completely normal. <laughs> and yet... I think he looks you... better than normal. <laughs> <laughs> and what you've been through, it, well, you, one would think you'd completely lose it. But there's something you know, that really testifies to God's, whether before you were even in Christ, the way that God has plans for us and purposes. And I think that uh, with our viewers just kind of also having their own stories and desirous to hear how God worked through your situation, I think many people are going to be encouraged tonight. Uh, Kurt, do you want to give a little bit, bit more about, um, you know? Yeah, I, I was just thinking, you know, before you start with your story, I, I was reading a book, I forget who it was by, about children who had the most difficult childhood imaginable. But all of these children had one thing in common, they accomplished great things. For example, before, if you were, were back in the 40s, early 50s, and you walked into a children's cancer ward or leukemia ward, basically, you were up in your knees and blood. They couldn't control that. So one guy, I forget his name, he had such a difficult childhood, but the author said that prepared him yeah. actually to make those hard decisions and do what other doctors didn't do before. Richard Branson, 
you know, yeah. with, with his dyslexia, etc. And even he said, he said, I don't want to wish this upon parents, but it, 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 was, it was almost a blessing that I had it because I couldn't read the blackboard. So I had to get people, recruit people, you know, take notes from that's me and so on. Said, yeah. And that, then that's why he's yeah. successful. So, you know, as we talk, maybe we can see some things that you thought were tragic that perhaps prepared and enabled you to become successful. And I believe that your, your, your best days are, are ahead of you as an author. Well, David, just before we start speaking to you, I just want to just explain to uh, the viewers, you know, just uh, basically that you're working as an independent employee relations consultant and accredited workplace mediator. Now that must be like all, all the things that you've learned even as a child now to be a mediator in a, in a situation. You also have a wife called Elsa and you live in London with your daughter Hayley. Uh, all these kind of things which are so normal for people who grow up with a regular life. These are huge accomplishments for somebody who's been through what you've been. So tell us about your, your, your uh, let's start with kind of like when you left care what took place and I know you studied oh you know when you found the Lord and everything let's just kind of let's start going kind of backwards so that we can um, yeah not lose the, the audience and the tragedy of your youth perhaps <laughs> but actually see the goodness of where you are now and what you've achieved so do you want me to start with where I am now or well yeah, yeah kind of let's work a little bit backwards I mean I'm actually personally I'm quite fascinated that you have yeah. all these skills to be a mediator you know a mediator has to have incredible amount of sensitivity, the authority to be able to actually deal in a situation. Yeah, tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, well, I mainly uh, help people in conflict at work. Um, so very often people fall out at work and they don't know how to deal with it. Um, quite often they will uh, go on sick, they will get stressed, they will suffer from anxiety, they will look for other jobs and ultimately they will resign. Um, and my job is really to come in usually um, when things are pretty bad um, to help restore the communication between people, um, sit them down together um, and try and get them to see how they might have contributed to the conflict um, <laughs> yeah. and also some ways forward as well. Um, and. Um, Generally speaking, mediation, work mediation um, in the UK has a 90% success rate. Really? Wow. That's absolutely fascinating. Wow. Oh, yes. Um, uh, and and uh, I mean, it's very easy to mess it up. I remember a former boss of mine asking me to sort out two conflicts at work before I'd had any training at all. And I, I just made them completely worse. Um, uh, <laughs> And I just found myself in a revolving door and thinking to myself, how am I going to get out of this? Uh, and eventually, uh, with one of them, uh, the woman just shouted at her colleague, a man, and said and screamed at him to get out of the room. And uh, so he got up with a smile on his face and exited. And I just oh, sat there thinking, well, that go very well. <laughs> so, so, so can I just ask you? Yeah. Do you know, in the situation in the homes that you, you were in as a child, yeah. uh, did you find that you had these certain skills that where you were able to do those kind of things, or these things that you learned much later after university and, and your studies? I think as a child, I would say a bit of a mess. Um, I was a bit of a bully, definitely. I think that's on the record. Um, and at other times, I would duck. I would be very shy. And uh, so I'd, um, I think it's only really since um, in my adult years that I've had the training that's helped me. On the other hand, mediation isn't for everyone. You've got to have a certain temperament. You've got to have a certain degree of unflappability. You've got to be quite analytical. Um, and as you said, you've got to try and tune into how people are thinking and feeling. But I don't think um, in the children's home, I. I was particularly uh, good at that. I think I was more on the bully side. In fact, uh, yeah. in my secondary school, I was um, part of a gang that was bullying other children. Ooh. So. Well, that gave you a good identity, didn't <laughs> it? I mean, the whole thing is that 
you know, kids need an identity and you identified with the gang and there you go. You know? We were in well, the inner city, so we understand that. Yes, you've got to get your self-worth from somewhere, haven't you? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so should we go back to the so beginning? So let's go back to the beginning. I mean, where would you like to start? You start where you want to start. Well, um, I start in the book with my mother writing to the children's home back in 1961. Um, and uh, she was in her early 20s. Her relationship with my, my dad had broken down. They were unmarried. Uh, she was back in London. She couldn't look after me and work as well. Uh, and also her mental health was starting to deteriorate. Uh, so what she did was uh, she approached Spurgeon's Children's Home um, and asked if they would take me on. Uh, and within a week, they took me on. So I entered uh, the children's home when I was 20 months old. Wow. Um, wow. So, um, yes, I mean, she had put me in that children's home because she herself had spent so several years in the same children's home because um, her mother... Um, was unable uh, to look after her. So she herself had some troubled, a troubled childhood um, and it started in a way to, to run in the family. But I think the most important thing for me was that she put me in a children's home that was safe. Mm. It kept me safe. Um, and the reason was because of the caliber of the, the staff there. They were, they were all Christians. Uh, there was no bullying, there were, there were no paedophiles, there were no predators. Wow, that's so wonderful. And sadly, of course, as we know, and I was just reading an article recently, the National uh, Inquiry into Child Abuse has found that during the 60s and the 70s in particular, just at the time I was in children's home, uh, so many people were abused, um, particularly in state care settings. So I was spared that. Um, the issues then I was having to deal with were issues about why I was in the children's home, why my parents had put them in there, put me in there. Um, and I, didn't re I wasn't really able to work on these until I left the children's home and started to uh, understand why I was there in the first place. Um, it wasn't helped that my mother's mental health deteriorated to a point where she had to be sectioned, um, and in fact, at age five, um, uh, she, uh, her mental health was such that she, she could uh, no longer even visit me. So she was sectioned in a psychiatric institution for most of her adult life, wow. uh, which means obviously that she was unable to visit me uh, unable to give me the kind of the love and, and attention that normally you'd expect from a mother. Uh, my father uh, didn't visit at all. Um, I didn't know why. I was just told that uh, he lived in another country. Um, actually, he lived in Switzerland. Um, and um, he, although he wrote to the homes, he never wrote directly to me. Um, and when I was five years old, he cut off any correspondence with the homes. Wow. So <laughs> when I said that um, my memoir is a journey to freedom from rejection, pain and loneliness, you could probably start to see why. Yeah, absolutely. Because being a young person, how can you process all of that? Hmm. Were, were so, there, David, can I just ask you, were there any... Yeah. You know, what, what were the relationships with the adults in, in, in the care home? Were, were, were they nurturing or was it more just general care? Was there anybody that you had an attachment to? Um, oh, definitely, yes. Um, I have to say that the care at the home was exemplary. Absolutely. Wow. Um, I, I, you know, I started off really as a kind of toddler um, and a lady called Miss Potter and her deputy, Miriam Cambridge, uh, used to crush the living daylights out of me. They obviously liked me a lot. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, I couldn't get enough of that affection. <laughs> so my, my memories, my earliest memories are very positive ones. Um, so I was in the kind of preschool, the, the baby hall, uh, until I was about three and a half, four. 
And then I moved up to the younger children's uh, house, uh, one of 12 uh, houses in the complex, uh, in a complex that at any one time could take up to 240 children. Wow. Um, with about 16, between 14 and 16 children in each house. Um, but uh, I then moved up and uh, I was looked after by a lady called Mary Thomas, um, who was really, go really good. I mean, she gave me a little bit of discipline and, uh, you know, I wasn't allowed to get away with everything, even with my blonde hair and blue eyes and, you know, and butter <laughs> melt in my mouth smile. Um, but I did have to buy, apparently, according to the records, I wasn't very happy sharing her affection with 15 or 14 other children. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but I have to say, some of, again, some of my, you know, we talk about going to your safe space. Yeah. Or your, your warm, cuddly space. Yeah. Uh, my my safe space, my warm, cuddly space, was in lying in a bed in that house uh, under the care of Mary Thomas. That is so precious. Um, that, so was precious. The, that was the safest place I felt, and it was just a nurturing place. Um, and I talk a little bit about uh, that in, in the book. Did you have any contact with her after you left? Sorry? Were you ever ever able to feed back and just say how much that meant to you? Yes, in fact, I spoke to Mary on the phone just a week ago. Really? Oh, wow. Wow. How old is she now? She's 89. Bless her. And she lives about a 20 minute car drive from me. So you've seen her? Yes, and she's got a copy of the book. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the guy, uh, the, the couple who looked after me from about eight until I was 16, 16, 17, uh, Mike and June Shern. Um, June sadly passed away two or three years ago, um, but I was in contact with her a few months before she passed away. Uh, and Mike is, is still with us. Uh, and I um, spoke to him a week ago. Wow, so this is amazing. I mean, so, but how does it feel? I mean, do they feel kind of like they're your relations? I mean, I, for, for us who grew up with parents and kind of a structure which is completely different from what you experience, how, how does it feel now? I mean, what, what do you, I don't know, what relationship do you feel you have with them? Oh, a very warm one, a very, a very grateful one. Um, I, I, I mean, Working in a children's home, uh, particularly Christian's children's home, it's a very sacrificial uh, vocation. I, I call them God's unsung heroes and heroines. Oh, wow. Wow. But I know uh, Mary is fond of saying to me, people say, well, Mary, you never married. You haven't got any children. She said, well, actually, let me correct you there. I've actually had 72. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, amazing. And I think Mike and June Shern would, would say the same. They haven't had 72, but they probably had getting on for 40 or 50. Wow, amazing. But what uh, a, absolutely what, amazing. Yeah, what, what, but what a gift because these, you know, one of my kind of favorite films, I suppose, is Jane Eyre. And I mean, in those days, you know, Dickens days and everything, I mean, all these stories of Oliver and Jane Eyre and various other people, you know, who were in care or were orphans or whatever the case is, you just hear the most horrendous stories. And of course, now in times of war and obviously during the Holocaust and then kids were just sent off to other countries without their parents and then the parents either died in the Holocaust. And, you know, you just have these horrendous stories and then you come on with your wonderful book and with these incredible, you know, really saturated with love and care so it's a really, a, you know, it feels like a good, a good news story, really. I mean, most of the, us would say, oh, that's so terrible. You grew up in, you know, in care. But, the, you know, to hear your perspective, David, is, is just really heartwarming. And uh, you just see how well you've kind of become an adult and just ad adapted to life and difficulties and marriage and having, you know, a child. I suppose you got one child. Is that right? Just one child? That's correct, yes. Yeah. And she's adopted, yeah. Yeah, so she's what? She's adopted. Is she? Okay, okay. Wow. So if you think it's come full circle. 
You're very full circle. <laughs> so where did you where did you adopt her from? Um, came back to the UK. We were in uh, Southeast Asia and we came back. We decided that before we got any older, we'd better come back and try. And so we adopted her. She was um, eight months old when we fostered her. And then she was 14 months old when we eventually adopted her. And she's now 18. Oh, nice age. <laughs> Thanks, so, yes. <laughs> so, so here's here's a question. I, I I remember you know being in boarding school for years, and and then you go back to civilian life, and it's just so different, you know, from the structure. I, I guess boarding school for me was like the military. I was one of those. I love boarding schools. I, I I didn't even go home for holidays sometimes because I liked it so much because they let me do crazy things like cut down trees, drive cars, had my own animals, a cow, et cetera, that I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning and and milk the cow, but. What were your, your greatest challenges of kind of getting out of care and going into the real world? What, what held you back? What, what did you have to overcome? Um, well, by the time I got to 16, um, I actually talked, been able to talk to my mother about some of the reasons why I was in the children's home for the first time. Wow. Um, and... Mm -hmm. So I, I, I started to think, um, what am I going to do? You know, I'm on my own. My mother can't look after me. There are no relatives who have expressed an interest in me. Um, and I, my initial um, idea was to join the Royal Navy because oh. uh, that was something that appealed to me. Like Melanie's father did that when he was 16, lied 17. about his age. Yeah, 17, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the idea was that that would give me a roof over my head and the routines and the, the stability and the predictability that I was used to. Uh, and also give me a trade that I could use in Civvy Street when I left. Now, the trade I wanted was he, to be an electrician okay. uh, and I passed all of the tests and, and everything uh, except that at the last hurdle they found out that I was red green color blind oh, oh no. yeah you don't want to <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> whoops <laughs> so you could say that 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 was dead in that career in the Royal Navy was dead in the water oh wow but wow. I had I had um so I then had to think, well, what am I going to do? And, and I thought, well, really, the next best thing is to, to try academically and um, get a decent job by getting some more qualifications. And interestingly, about the same time, um, I'd been called to the deputy headmaster's study along with my friends uh, because we'd been up to something uh, that we shouldn't have been. <laughs> yes, as you do, as you do as yeah. teenagers. <laughs> Um, and he he asked me to stay behind. He let my friends go, and he, he his name was Major Tuppen, and he was he was well known for uh, caning children very hard. Oh dear! So I expected the worst. I thought, you know, what has he discovered that I've managed to hide so far? <laughs> and I kind of was trembling as he said, "Mida," he said, "You're an intelligent lad." He said, you've got a choice. You can either keep on playing up to impress your friends and end up with a dead end job. He said, or you can use that brain that, you know, God has given you and achieve much more. Wow. And I remember just two, two conflicting feelings, really. One of relief that I'd got away from him pain free. Um, and secondly, the kind of the incongruity of this man who actually didn't seem most of the time to, to be very caring, but all of a sudden was actually demonstrating to me that he cared. Wow. And that really struck me. And I began to think, well, actually, David, you know, what are you going to do after school, after the homes? Uh, and that really started to focus me on, OK, what do I need in order to get a good job? And I thought, well, the most obvious thing is to try and get more qualifications and training so that I can get a better paid job than um, what I'm heading for at the moment. So that was the first thing. Um, to cut a long story short, um, the head teacher at that school, which is a secondary modern and not particularly renowned for educational excellence, 
um, said that he would, um, if I got sufficient grades, that he would um, endorse me to go to a better um, school, a technical high school, which is now a grammar school. Yeah. And I managed to scrape into that. So I took O-levels there. Um, and during that time, uh, by the time I'd taken O-levels, it was due for me to leave Spurgeon's, uh, the children's home. And is that is that 16, 17? How old were you then? I was 17 and a half. Okay. And they had a legal responsibility for me until 18. Okay. And I remember just think, I, I, I remember, I, I talk about it in the book, just thinking, being very worried about this because it was just a blank. What am I going to do after I leave the homes? Hmm. You know, oh. I've, got, I've got nowhere to go. Uh, I just haven't. Um, and in, at that point, uh, the new principal, or the relatively new principal, a guy called John Honey, approached me and said, David, how do you feel about um, going up to Coventry with Mike and June Shearn, who were the people who had been looking after me, uh, because we're closing down the big 30-acre uh, acre place with 240 kids and moving to a new model of social care, which is individual houses with maybe half a dozen children in each. And, you know, I was just absolutely staggered by that. It was kind of God's provision. Um, and I moved up to Coventry. Uh, I stayed with Mike and June for a few weeks while I found my feet, <laughs> excuse me. And then just after my 18th birthday, um, I f they helped me find some digs nearby. And I started to study A-levels at the Technical College in Coventry. Wow. So do, were you still visiting them and were they still open to having you around for a meal or from time to time or, or was it a, a total cut off? No, they, they, the, their door was always open. Lovely, lovely. Uh, the main problem I faced there um, was that I didn't have enough money to live on. Um, and so I quickly got into debt. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, then that was compounded by the fact that um, I f didn't get very good grades first time round for my A-levels. Um, and then on one particular night in November 1979, um, and which I write about in the book, so I won't spoil it, uh, but had a crisis really. Uh, and God met me very powerfully. Um, and from that, all, that, that time on, um, although my circumstances didn't change, I had new reasons for hope. Wow. And, and so, because I just couldn't face another year of, what, of the two years that I'd been through, it was very, very, very difficult. I think I must at some stage been on the, the verge of a, a mental breakdown. Wow. The stress wow. um, and the sense of pressure, you know, that I, you know, I can't, nobody else can achieve these exam results. I'm the only one that's got to do it. And it also a sense that, you know, Mike and June, while they're there, um, they, they can't take the exams for me. True. So anyway, I, I, I also reached a point where John Honey stepped in, the principal with the trustees and said, we're opening up a kind of halfway house hostel for people who've left care, which must have been one of the first in the country, really visionary. And actually that I moved in there and I was able to scrape through my A-levels and get uh, a university place. Wow, amazing. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. But that, so that solved, if you like, and then as they say, the rest of, is history. I, I got a degree and I got a job in human resources. The other kind of double track though, uh, was this, I was aware increasingly that I was carrying this m emotional baggage. Yes. Uh, I was kind of like a, a walking volcano. Um, so from time to time, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd get angry, I'd get confused and, and just, I had just have a, a swirl of emotions and I, I knew I couldn't cope with it. I couldn't face with it. I just had to carry it with me. And I, I basically tried to rationalize it. You know, a, a lot of it was to do with my parents. Uh, obviously I hadn't met my dad. Yes. Uh, in fact, um, when I had that crisis in November 1979, 
I wrote uh, a two line letter to him at his last known address. Wow. But again, I won't spoil it because it's, it's quite dramatic. <laughs> a two line. Do you say two lines? Just two line and, <laughs> okay. and both lines said the same thing. So they so they have to get the book to re, to find out what you said. <laughs> oh yes, you're not getting any uh, you're not getting any secret. It's not any free. Uh, nothing nothing uh, gory. <laughs> so wow. I had this emotional. So I had the, the emotional journey. I I realised that, you know, um, what I'd done, was I'd actually put up a, a because I'd been so hurt mm. by my parents. Mm. Yes. Uh, and actually by institutionalisation. Um, that was the other thing that I was having to deal with. I mean, you know, I had exemplary care, but there was no getting away from the fact that I had been shaped by institutional care life. Yes. Uh, and I, that, that I had to work through that. Uh, but where to do that and where to feel safe was a very, very, well, how, it was not. How, how did you work through that practically? You know? uh, well, first of all, I went into denial. Um, one of the things that one of my friends at Technical College said to me when I let out, because I hardly ever told anybody about my care background um, because there was a stigma attached to it. Um, they, he said to me, oh, oh, you seem to have done very well, you know, come through it OK. And I said, and I thought, well, you know, this is a very wise and mature thing to say. I said, um, well, you never really get over these things completely. You just learn to put them in perspective. Hmm which was actually just a sophisticated form of denial. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. I hadn't got over them. I hadn't put them in perspective. I was still, I was just pushing it down. Yeah, yeah. So in answer to your, uh, your uh, question, Kurt, how did I deal with it? I think the first place was um, when I encountered God very in a very powerful way. He spoke to me through Psalm 139. Which I'm sure your viewers are very part yep. of it, yep. are very familiar with. Um, but then uh, I went to All Nations Christian College. I had a very good um, in the mid '80s. I had a very good um, series on pastoral care, mm -hmm. and um, I thought it was actually there to teach us how to help other people. But actually, the the sub agenda was. Actually, we're here to help you identify your issues before you go overseas. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and implode. Yeah, or make life hell for other people. Um, so that was kind of the starting point. I thought, oh, you know, I really have got some issues. But I didn't know. I, I was looking for two things. I was looking for somebody I could feel safe with, who, who wouldn't, wouldn't blab, who, who would keep confidences. And I needed somebody who knew how to to minister the love and the healing power of the Lord to me. Yes. And when Elsa and I got married in 1989, within two years of our marriage, we both realized that we needed help. <laughs> and we eventually, uh, we eventually found help with a Christian ministry called Wholeness Through Christ. Wonderful. And which is still going today. And af after three sessions, um, prayer schools, they call them, I was kind of, you know, the healing was absolutely amazing. I was a different person. Wow. After three sessions. Well, three over over three years. Yeah. Uh, and and you get a three hour session or three to four hour session each time. Wow. What, what was like, it, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of things that happened, but what was the one thing that contributed towards your healing? I think it, for the first time, I felt safe enough to talk about and to express my pain um, because I was very wounded um, and, and kind of at the, at the base of a lot of my anger, underneath the anger was the pain, mm. underneath the pain was the wounding. Mm. Yeah. And there was a lot of wounding in terms of self-esteem, in terms of me feeling, actually, I don't feel that valuable. I don't feel loved. And I came out, I suppose the reverse way of answering it is this. I came out of my first session of me having written in capital letters on my, my sheet to, to walk out my healing. I will live my life as a person who is of importance and value to God. Beautiful. Wow. 
Beautiful. That was what was missing. Mm. And yeah. that was yeah. the, that was the bedrock um, for my my recovery, really, to, to have a sense instead of having these emotions swirling around and, yeah. and thinking, am I, you know, do I really matter? I come to a place where people were able to minister God's love and affirmation to me. And, and then I was able to take that and, and walk that out over over the years until of course, you see this perfectly and well-adjusted person in front of you. <laughs> Are we all well-adjusted? Not really. So, David, at this time, if you, if you don't mind, um, we have some interaction with our beautiful viewers. And we have um, Dylan, hello, big kiss to you. Um, I have read your email, Dylan, and um, we are going to be praying for you. Thank you so much. Uh, the discussion right now is not really appropriate, you know, with David being here and, and talking about um, his walk. But uh, we want to just say we, we love you and we're glad that you're safe and you're OK. And we will be praying for you for the situation that you spoke about. And maybe we'll get an opportunity to read this, um, you know, for, uh, for Friday's program. OK, so we love you and um, just, you know, just know that God has his hand on you. <coughs> then we have... Um, so, um, David, perhaps this we might require some um, interaction with you. It says, hi, Kurt and Melanie, it's in my life. I am a new viewer to Insight Live, and we are very well, you're very welcome, and we're glad that you've joined us. But when I've seen the details from the program tonight, I had to watch it. Furthermore, I hope my email is helpful to others too, as this might, uh, as this, uh, the brothers is. Okay, my name is Ian Lewis Sharp. Hi, Ian. Lovely to meet you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm 37 from Glasgow, Scotland, UK. I lost my, my something, nearly 12, I think, I don't know whether it's your dad, nearly 12 at 12, and my mum two months from my 19th birthday too. So I've been an orphan for a long time, and also, as a result, I myself was brought up in care and was bullied. I got caught up in sectarianism uh, uh, when moved to uh, live in Northern Ireland, then came back to Glasgow in 2009 and was so jitter, so jitter, I tried uh, to attack rival foot fa football fans and suffered a brain injury, resulting in my spending two weeks in a coma. Wow. Wow. Ian, that's uh, amazing. Today I still struggle with this, but my faith in Christ is what I cling to. I give uh, my life to Jesus when I was 27 in September 2013. Please pray for me to receive um, healing uh, that the brother, brother has for. I do struggle a lot as a single man with no kids and struggle with church. God bless the three of you and all Revelation TV. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for writing. That was really brave of you to write in and uh, we're so glad that you found us on Insight Live. And I'm wondering, David, whether you would have something to share with, uh, with Ian and, and perhaps if you felt led to pray for him, you know, please feel free. We, we, you know, we love to minister to our viewers. Yes, I, I, I'll pray for him now. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for Ian. Um, Lord, I'm so glad that you know all about his situation. And Lord, you're wanting to do something in his life, something precious, something really important. And I pray, Lord, that you will lift him, that, Lord, he'll have a sense of your hand upon his shoulder. And that, Lord, whenever he needs your help, Lord, he will feel, yes, I can, I can speak to my Heavenly Father who loves me where I am. And my Heavenly Father has good things for me. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for Ian's faith in you. Mm. And I know, Lord, that you will reward that mm. uh, in the days to come. Mm. Amen. 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 And uh, Dylan has just written in. Thank you for that, um, David. Dylan, who is a regular um, and um, just a very brave soul, and he says, hi, Kurt and Melanie, and very special guest. My mother, like yourself, who has had so much of a horrific life that she won't trust Jesus. She was born to a single mom uh, who was an alcoholic, and the house was filled with, constantly filled with drunkards. And you can imagine what men did to her, etc. She won't trust God. And that's love, Dylan. And uh, Dylan also had an, an injury, um, David. Um, 
you know, was abused by his father and, and various things in which he's been very open with a lot of the, um, in some of our programs and everything. Um, <clears throat> no. And uh, he just wrote in tonight and said that he had a bit of a, a problem with his lungs and went unconscious and uh, to, you know, get a taxi, call up for a taxi. And he's, he's actually wanting to have a lung transplant, which we didn't know. So um, I'm wondering whether you could just speak something encouraging to him as well. He's, he's had a very, uh, kind of like yourself, his mother was damaged, um, he's been damaged, and uh, he's, re he's actually waiting to be baptized, and he's longing for more of God and for, for a healthy life, um, you know, yes. So that's Dylan. Yes, yeah, Dylan, I, I think this is, this is what I would say to you. The, First of all, be real with God. I think that's the big lesson that I learned through all my difficulties. Be real. Tell him as it is, how you feel. Don't pretend. Secondly, be courageous. Yeah, that's what it often takes in these circumstances. And thirdly, be confident. Be confident that God is greater than your situation and that God loves you, he'll see you through it. Mm. Um, I think those are the three things that, from my life, that I would say to you right now, uh, and reach out for that help as God offers it, um, because God is a God who loves his kids, uh, and I'm sure he's working in your life to make you a blessing as well to others who find themselves in similar situations. Uh, for me, that in a way, that's what it's all about. It's taking those difficulties, those limitations, uh, and the, the hard things in our lives, allowing God to work in us through them so that we can be a source of blessing and encouragement to those coming behind us. So bless you. Mm, David, excellent. I'm, uh, Dylan, I'm telling you, those are words from God. I really witness with those encouragements, and especially the last one as well, just having that confidence that God loves you. And of course, you've got a Revelation TV family and you've got people like Anita. And, and also the other thing, Dylan, um, is that you have actually made a huge difference in your mother's life. You've got people praying for her. Um, you've, you've shown how you've changed and you've, you've become the man of God that you, you long to be. This is very exciting. So we want to just really encourage you, okay? Uh, one more, David, we have here. I was abused in every way from 14 years by my dad. I didn't get healing until I was 45. And we want to just say, we just praise God that you have had that yeah. healing come. Uh, yeah. David, you're welcome to say anything if you, you feel stirred to do that. Yes, I think, uh, I think for me, a big issue was around forgiveness. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we want justice before we'll, we'll forgive. But we may never get that justice. But thankfully, you found uh, healing that's great, fundamentally, because I think healing and forgiveness go to go together. And sometimes our feelings of forgiveness take a little while uh, to catch up with the actual act of forgiveness. Um, I'm sure that's something for, for your viewers. Um, yes, healing is so important. It takes courage. It takes reality. It takes confidence in the Lord's provision and his real unconditional love for us so yeah bless you wonderful thank you so much so alan you've written in and uh, it would be great if you had something to do uh, relating to the subject tonight i know that you feel that the emails are a little unfair and some we read out and some we shorten or whatever but that's at the discretion of the presenter and because there's a flow in a program and it has to keep you know to keep flowing so you know i'm sorry that you feel uh, the way you do but you're so welcome to write in i would love to read what uh, you have to say about this program and about david's fantastic story we're going to be giving you details later on about his uh, you know how to get his book and and uh, and maybe the, the subject of the next book so uh, alan don't be disturbed about some people's being read out and some people's not. We have to just discern. Uh, and sometimes we run out of time as well, so we have to kind of just kind of quickly uh, just summarize. So just please don't be put off by uh, or, or be offended by some of the things. And Dennis does write in and he does have poems as well. 
Um, so maybe I can read that later. But let's continue um, asking more, more of the questions that the viewers are probably longing for, Kurt. Some of, more of his story, perhaps. Well, I, I, I want to hear your relationship with your mother, your father, not everything because that's in the book, but what you can tell us and how you worked out on that. I mean, I, I mean, when you were a little child and all your friends were going home for the holidays and nobody took you or nobody was interested yep. in you, how did you work through that? Uh, with great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where to start, really. I think... Um, one starting place was when I was 16 years old and uh, the principal, John Honey, uh, spoke to my mother and said, you know, you really need to have a conversation with David. Um, and that was the first time that uh, I, I knew why I was in the children's home. Um, she told me about, you know, what I told you earlier on. Um, uh, so uh, that... Uh, that was the, the start of it all. Um, so I knew my mother. I'd never met my dad. Um, with my mother, a lot of our relationship was severely uh, restricted by her mental health. I mean, she had paranoid schizophrenia. If anybody knows about that mental condition, it basically means that you think that people, in its worst form, means that people are out to kill you. Mm. Um, it's that bad. Uh, and the, the, the medicines that she had to stop her losing her mind completely kind of just left her in a very kind of soporific and very slowed down state. So she was very disabled by the medicines, but she needed the medicines in order to stay remotely sane. Um, that was very difficult. Um, and I think it's at times like that, you can, you, I, I try to talk to my mother about these and said, you know, if there's anything to forgive, I do forgive you. But um, I think that she actually could never forgive herself because one of the things that came to light once I got my care records was that actually my dad had offered um, to take me off her hands and out of the children's home when I was five years old. Uh, but she had legal custody, so he needed her permission. Um, and she didn't give that permission uh, for whatever reason. Um, and that meant that I stayed in the children's home for another 11, 12 years. Hmm. So that, that must have required some kind of forgiveness with that because that would have been a whole different life. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So um, absolutely. Um, but then on the other hand, she was mentally ill. Mm. Um, and, I, and I say in my book, you know, in some ways I wish she wasn't my mother. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I came to accept that she was. Uh, and I had to accept her with her limitations. Um, and, you know, the, the great verses in Revelation 21 where the Lord says he's going to make everything new and there's going to be no pain. Yeah. <laughs> crying. Yeah. You know, I, I believe the Lord has mercy on my mother. Mm. And what is at the heart of the gospel, as, as the, you know, the Apostle James says, you know, is that mercy triumphs over judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe that. You know, and I believe that the Lord looks at my mother with all her limitations and said, how on earth? Could I, you know, do anything but lay my hands upon her mm. and heal mm. her and, and put her back to her rightful state? Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah. well, you know, Lord, if you have forgiven me, <laughs> you know, for so much, um, it, it's to be honest, it wasn't difficult to forgive her, particularly when I got that help from the Wholeness Through Christ prayer ministry. Mm. So that was the story of my mum. And, you know, I'm able to to bless her from my heart. I was. I mean, she died in her mid-60s. My dad, um, I had correspondence with him that uh, night of crisis when I was 19. I uh, sent the letter off and he wrote to me, but eventually and periodically, perhaps once or once a year or once every three years. Um, but he kept on safe subjects. 
after I got married, I decided we decided that um, we'd go and visit him. And by that time, I'd had the prayer ministry and been able to work through a lot of that stuff. Good. And so when I was 31, we went to Switzerland and met him. Wow. Wow. Now, wow. <laughs> now, now one of the sidelines, one of the God incidences is, is that my wife Elsa is half Swiss as well. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, and and her aunt actually lived only about a 10, 15 minute drive away from where my dad was living. Wow. wow. So make of that what you will. So we have that Swiss connection. Um, and he took us to a nice restaurant on a, overlooking the, the lakeside town of Rapperswil, um over the Lake of Zurich. Uh, he paid for it, which I was very happy about. Um, wow. And then you had that pregnant pause where you actually think oh, you need to talk about serious stuff. And he opened up and he said, he said, David, he said, I've never done, I haven't done anything in my life that I regret. And I said to him, he said, um, well, Walter, I forgive you. And the reason I can forgive you is because Jesus has forgiven me. Wow. Wow. Now, he didn't, he didn't say anything. I think his mouth kind of dropped open a bit. <laughs> so, because I think he was expecting aggression. Yeah. A whole lot of vitriol. But it kind of, his face was kind of, you know, what does that mean? And what's religion got to do with this? Wow. And so I, I had an opportunity to explain the gospel to him. I said, we've all messed up. I said, we don't even keep our own standards, let alone God's. <laughs> wow. Um, but you can read a little bit more about it in the in the in the book. Well, David, that that is a you know we're coming to the end of the program right now, but th this is a very good way. It's to a great ending. <laughs> with 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 you know just encouraging our our, re our you know our viewers yeah. that actually you know get in the book and and if they've got trouble with relations, the way that you were able to forgive your father, the way you were able to process what was happening with your mother. I mean, your story is absolutely outstanding, and we are so grateful that you have come on this program tonight. I've got a couple more emails where people have written in, but we want to just ask you how we can get hold of the book, Kurt. Come on, yeah. let's get hold of What's this What's the best book. way to get hold of the book today? Well, <laughs> yeah, the, the book is um, published by Malcolm Down Publishing, um, and you can get it on Amazon in Kindle form. Um, if you don't like Amazon, then go to Malcolm uh, Down. Um, and there are some other retailers, Christian retailers like Eden Great. Uh, and Revive. Perfect, perfect. And uh, just okay. quickly, you're, you're the, the next book that you're work, you're, uh, you are working on, when, was that, when will that be out? Um, that's a good question. A year, maybe a year, 18 months. Okay, well, you be in contact with us or Malcolm will anyway. Well, we'll interview him again. Okay, well, we, yeah, because we look forward to having you back on the program. So we do have to say goodbye. Kurt, would you like to thank uh, David so much? Yeah, David, thank you so much just for being vulnerable, being yourself, being honest. And it's been a great encouragement to, to our viewers. As, yeah, as so on behalf see. of our viewers, we want to just give you a very, very warm thank you. All the best with your book. And thank you so much for sharing your beautiful story. God bless you. Okay, David. Bye. Wow. What That's it. a wonderful Bye. story. Well, quickly, quickly, we have um, the person who wrote in about their dad. They said, I, I forgave my dad for the abuse and pray for salvation, not, not interested in justice. And Cynthia also said one of her uh, favorite Psalms, 139, and when she was nursing her late husband with dementia. Uh, but I just want to say that, David, that whatever we go through, uh, it's a completely different situation to mine, but I just wanted to give him a cuddle. I'm 81, and I work with special needs children who sadly went from pillar to post. But in our darkest hours, through all times, we don't see God as the tiny, the tiny light beckoning for us to go to him to heal all our hearts, etc. We just pray that you had an amazing time tonight. What an encouraging time. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for your emails, and I hope that this program has really been a blessing to you. And please go out and buy David's book. And it's great to be with you as always, and we will see you next week. And it's getting towards Christmas. Bye. We love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.